Good evening, everybody. My name is Dundee West, and I'm a security analyst at Booz Allen Hamilton. Tonight, I will, be dis be I will discuss a paper that I started writing at the University of Maryland School of Law in order to fulfill the law school's um, advanced writing requirements. In this paper, I argue that the current rules of war can address the emerging issues raised by cyber warfare. Before I begin, just a few quick caveats. First, um, the views expressed and the opinions expressed in this talk are mine and mine alone. They don't represent the views of Booz Allen Hamilton or any entity of the U.S. government. Secondly, this talk is for general um, information purposes only and, and is not intended to be and should not be taken as legal or consultant advice on any matter. My purpose here tonight is just to uh, contribute towards a uh, what I think is an important topic and uh, just to contribute to the debate. So what will we talk about tonight? First, I'll give an introduction to computer network operations and the actors that are involved. Secondly, I'll give a survey of the laws that I, feel, I, that I believe have the largest impact on cyber warfare. I will also give, my, um, give a little bit of brief commentary on um, some popular issues that I think um, intensify the cyber warfare debate. And then I'll get to the meat and potatoes of uh, my paper where I would give five reasons why I believe the U.S. should not enter into an international treaty for cyber warfare. Immediately upon taking office and in, and in the midst of the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, President Obama commissioned a 60-day study to review the plans, programs, and activities related to cybersecurity. And an investigation of recent events show why securing cyberspace has been named a major national security priority of the Obama administration. First, uh, we have all probably heard about the 2008 cyber attack against Georgia or the Estonia cyber war. It is now commonplace for cyber-related events to make the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I have a clip in there. And actually, when that clip in, um, came out, just two or three days later, it was another um, cyber-related clipping. So I think um, as a whole, we all get the uh, threat of, of uh, cybersecurity. So uh, that was just interesting. But um, the results of the 60-day study I thought was interesting. They included several near-term and mid-term action plans. One action item recommended that legal analysis be conducted concerning cybersecurity issues. However, this action item is rather broad and vague. In particular, under this action item, the government is not required to address the unique issues that arise as a result of cyber warfare. In fact, there remains an intense debate on whether there should be an international treaty for cyber warfare, hence the purpose of my paper. I will now give a brief introduction to uh, computer network operations and the actors uh, that are involved. So uh, when you hear the word cyber, I think it's thrown around sort of loosely. I believe that analysts often discuss the concepts of cyber warfare and cyber security in overly broad terms. For example, if a cyber actor gains unauthorized access to a computer network and copies data, then a commentator may refer to this act as a cyber attack. But if the cyber actor is merely snooping and didn't alter the, the performance or content of the network, then a cyber attack hasn't occurred according to military doctrine because cyber acts can be divided into three uh, unique domains, collectively titled computer network operations or CNO. CNO is one of uh, five core domains under information operations. The other four um, domains are uh, psychological operations or PSYOP, military deception or MILDEC, operation security or OPSEC, and electronic warfare. So just a little bit, a uh, few more details about computer network operations. Under computer network operations, you have three more uh, subdomains called computer network defense, computer network or exploitation, and computer network attack. Um, more information about these can be found in the Joint Pub 3-13, and the cover of it is seen on the, uh, on the, on the slide. Below, um, below each one of those uh, subdomains, I've, I've included the formal definition out of the Joint Pub. Um, that's a little bit long, so I'm going I'm to give you my version of the definition. Uh, first, CND, uh, that's what most people are familiar with. 
That's just traditional computer security, such as deploying a firewall or some type of intrusion detection system. Um, CNE, um, and the lines between CNE and CNA can sometimes be kind of blurry, but uh, a good definition, a good uh, easy to remember definition for CNE to me is uh, that'll be like snooping and you don't affect the performance or alter any, the, the, the performance of the network and you don't alter any data. And then CNA, the way I like to define CNA is that you are negatively affecting the performance or you're altering data of an information system. Uh, this paper is mainly concerned with CNA. So from henceforth, when I use the term uh, cyber warfare, that's synonymous with uh, computer network attack. Because again, when we're saying stuff about cybersecurity, that, that term can be really, really broad, and I want it to be understood that I'm, I'm referring to the laws related to computer network attack. So I promised myself that I was gonna find a way to talk about Ravens football. I love the Baltimore Ravens. I'm a season ticket holder, a proud season ticket holder. <laughs> With that said, uh, I have what I call, uh, oh, hmm. So I have, uh, so, I, so uh, when I was first learning this stuff, it's, it's, it's kind of dry. You know, when I first uh, decided to, you know, uh, do this research in law school, I, I, at first I thought it was all sexy and all this stuff, and I found out this is, this is simply military doctrine, and it, it kind of seems um, sort of dry. So I had to think of a fun way to remember these domains. So I call this the, the uh, Dundee's football example to break down these three domains. So first, you know, when we're talking Ravens football, right, CND, that's Ray Lewis and company. So they're, they're the protectors, CND, that's pretty straightforward. CNA, that's Joe Flacco, Ray Rice, you know, they're on the attack, ready to score. Now CNE, Dundee, what the world, like, how can you um, relate CNE to football? Think real hard, you know who the CNE guys are. They are the guys that are up in the press box, you know, uh, sending down plays, calling in signals. One thing, um, uh, Peyton Manning, for instance, if you watch Peyton Manning, he's always on the, side, on the sidelines and he's looking at pictures while the defense is on the field, Peyton Manning, is, he's always looking at pictures. Those pictures are probably pictures taken from a blimp of plays and formations. He's, getting, he's essentially getting the intel from the press blocks. So that's how I like to remember CND, CNE, and CNA, Dundee's football example. So uh, a similar distinction must be made when we talk about the actors that are involved. For the purposes of this study, I consider two unique scenarios in order to limit the actors involved. First, a nation state versus a nation state. That may be uh, a traditional conflict, you know, a nation going against another nation. Secondly, we have a nation state versus a non-state actor. Now that, that one is a little bit more interesting, but a good way to remember that one is, is if you think about uh, what happened post 9-11. Uh, right immediately after 9-11, I believe the next day, you had the UN uh, Security Council Resolution number 1368, where uh, basically a nation state was authorized to take action against a non-state actor, which were, you know, terrorists. So for the purpose of this study, um, not really concerned with international cyber crimes, not concerned with a uh, situation where it's a private hacker going against a, uh, another private hacker. Um, uh, Another situation is um, attribution. So like, you know, if we're gonna talk about the scope of cyber actors, um, a good question is like attribution. Like how do you know who's doing what on the internet? The internet is international. Attribution is a very, very important topic. I think it's probably the most important topic when it comes to cyber security. But, you know, for the purpose of this study, I had to uh, leave attribution as a separate and a unique issue. But I plan to include attribution in the future. So, um, so now I will talk about the, uh, the laws of cyber warfare. So first, um, here's one interesting thing that I found out when I started this study. The laws of conventional warfare are applicable to the laws of cyber warfare. So to say that is to say, the same laws that govern um, sh shooting a missile also governs conducting cyber warfare. So I, like, I, I chose to divide it into two regimes. One, uh, what are the laws pre-hostility, you know, before a actual conflict begins? And what are the laws post-hostility, you know, while, while a war is ongoing? So that's the way I divided up these laws. So pre-hostilities. 
Um, the long and short of it is, you know, under UN Charter, UN um, the, under the UN Charter, Charter Article Two Four, there's basically a uh, general prohibition against all uses of force. And I, I think the UN Charter is pretty clear on that: all uses of force. So, how clear is that? Let me give a crazy example. Um, if one nation was to get a soldier to pick up a pebble and throw, a, throw that pebble towards the embassy of another nation um, under the UN Charter Article, and it's a far out example, and I don't know if two na nations will actually go to war over a pebble being thrown, but I'm, used, I'm, I'm giving this example just to prove show a point. Um, so a soldier throws a pebble at that UN, um, at that embassy. Technically, the, uh, the UN Security Council has the authority to uh, sanction that act or to punish that act, to say that that act was an unlawful use of force. They more than likely, chances are they won't, but they have that power to say that it was. Now there is an exception to that general prohibition against uses of force. That exception is under Article 51, it's the general right to self-defense. So to put those two rules together, and we're talking pre-hostilities war, to put those two rules together, there is a general prohibition against all uses of force except those sanctioned by the UN Security Council or authorized by the US, UN Security Council or those done in self-defense. So that's pre-hostilities. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but that's very important because it's a lot of talk uh, that I see going on about when is a cyber act a use of force. I think that that may be sort of, uh, it's not that important if you think about the UN's broad authority. Their authority is pretty much all uses of forces uh, are prohibited, unless otherwise you know, noted as below. So post hostilities, this is a little bit interesting because this is talking about the laws during an ongoing conflict. So basically, uh, once two nations are in an armed conflict with each other, the laws of war applies. The law of war must apply in all operations, including cyber operations. So that's where that piece come in where I said the laws of conventional warfare are the same for cyber warfare. The law of war must apply in all military operations, including cyber operations. And here's another one. Only lawful military targets may be attacked. So, um, so in the conventional um, context, you know, if a building was about to be bombed, that building must be shown to be a lawful uh, military target. So the cyber, uh, in, the cyber um, equivalent to that is, you know, before a computer can be hacked, before a network can be hacked, that network must be shown to be a lawful military target. So how do you tell what is a lawful military target? Well, combatant commanders are required to use, um, consider three principles. Those principles are distinction, balancing military necessity with humanity, and proportionality. So first about distinction. Distinction, under distinction two concepts emerge. These are um, mainly that uh, there must be a form of distinction between combatant and non-combatant commanders. And then secondly, and the one that I think is the most important is that there is a duty to conduct warfare in manners that minimizes harms to civilians. So we'll talk about, let's talk about distinction in the cyber context. In the cyber context, so we know that uh, the internet is uh, it's very, uh, it's pretty much interconnective. So the chances are, if you want to attack something on the internet, that is also serving a dual purpose to um, do something to uh, assist uh, civilians. So for that, for, for because of that, you know, commanders must take reasonable steps to limit attacks on the part of the network used by the enemy. So a good example of that is, if a virus was to be released, in a network that's essential to, civil to a civilian function such as banking or electrical power. And you know, so even though you may have a military purpose to you know, attack that network, if that network is also servicing um, banking or electrical power, that likely violates the principle of distinction. And so second, military necessity and humanity. These are two parts. Necessity, an attack on a target must further legitimate uh, military objectives or grant a definite military advantage. And on the humanity, the attack shouldn't cause unnecessary surf, uh, suffering. So in the context of cyber, let's say that uh, someone, uh, this is a hypothetical example, someone wanted to attack a power system or what many call a SCADA system. Here, uh, 
to cross the threshold to legally do this according to uh, military necessity, that's easy. You could easily argue that it's, it's a military necessity. But, you know, let's throw out a question. What if that power also supplies a civilian hospital? Now the principles of humanity might be violated because even though you have a purpose to attack, you know, um, um, a SCADA system, it may have the uh, the, the uh, collateral effect of uh, unnecessarily affecting a civilian hospital. Last but not least, um, proportionality. This is basically a, I call it a calculus. And a good way to remember this is that the ends must justify the means. And for, for the business types out there, um, this, is, this is essentially a return on investment analysis. Basically, you know, what you're doing must be worth it. The ends must justify the, name, the means. So that's post hostilities. So now, I, you know, I'll uh, take a few minutes to hop on um, my soapbox. We have uh, discussed computer network operations and the actors involved. We have looked at laws related to cyber warfare, both pre and post hostilities. And I will now provide commentary on um, popular issues that I believe are anticipate, uh, anticipating the cyber warfare debate. So first, we have um, the use of force debate. A popular issue, as I was discussing it before, is about um, the use of force. When is a cyber act considered a use of force? One of the most um, popular answers to that question was proposed by Michael Smith. Um, he's very, very famous. I read everything I can, anything I can get my hands on that he wrote, I read. He basically had proposed a multi-factor test to determine when a cyber act constitutes a use of force. Smith, um, he recommends a consequence-based analysis to determine whether an act constitutes a use of force using the following factors. First, severity. He looks at immediacy, directness, invasiveness, measurability, um, the presumptive legitimacy, and responsibility. But um, so, so what, my response to that is, you know, as a reminder and what I was saying earlier, you know, it may not even be that important because all uses of force are presumed to be wrong for it unless it was, you know, allowed by the UN Security Council or done on the self-defense. So then the question is, you know, should the UN Security Council just be uh, required to adopt one standard multi-factor test? Well, my response to that is that a multi-factor test may unnecessarily um, limit the broad authority that the UN Council has. I think that with cyber acts, it's very important that the UN Security Council maintain their broad authority. Now, it is one way that a lot of courts, when it comes, you know, when you're making a rule, uh, multi-factor tests are very commonplace in the law. Most of the time when courts want to maintain a broad authority, they may have a list of multi-factors, but that last factor may allow for, them, allow for the court to maintain its broad authority. So, for example, you may have a statute or a law with factor one, factor two, factor three, all the way down to the last factor. And then that last factor will then say it'll be very broad. After all those factors, and any other factor that the court deems necessary. So I would like to propose and add to the Smith test that in addition to his uh, numbered factors, it be another factor added that says, and any other factor you know, that the UN Security Council deems necessary or something to that effect. That way the UN Security Council maintains their broad authority, but then still has a standard. But that's, that's sort of the only way I, I, would, I agree with a multi-factor uh, test. So then, um, you know, in light of uh, the general prohibition against uses of force, I, I want to propose the following rule. A nation conducting any, uh, any CNA prior to hostilities is legally doing so only in the case of reasonable self-defense. If self-defense is not involved, then the nation actor is conducting CNA with the risk of being sanctioned or punished by the UN Security Council. That's the rule I, I propose. I think that'll be a great standard. Now, does the UN Security Council need to do more to monitor um, cyber acts? Yes. But I don't think it implies that the uh, current rules of war are inadequate for addressing cyber warfare. So secondly, um, I've been seeing a, an analogy floating around called the cyber arms race, or cyber gain, or um, the cyber cold war, that type thing. I think that that is uh, sort of an exaggeration. So basically, we're comparing cyber weapons to nuclear weapons. I think that that may be an unfair comparison. Furthermore, I believe that that may uh, give a false sense of urgency of the, of the necessity of 
creating a cyber treaty. So, you know, when you hear um, cyber, um, you know, Cold War, when you hear that, you automatically think about, you know, the dangers of nuclear power, and now all of a sudden you think it's necessary to create a, uh, a international treaty for cyber warfare, and I think that that's, that's a danger of doing that. So, um, so then, similar though, similar to that though, it's important to know that the cyber threat is real. I don't know if you guys um, heard of it, but recently there was a debate where, um, you know, Bruce Snyder came out and he, he said something that was pretty revolutionary. He believed that, you know, the cyber threat has been grossly uh, exaggerated. Now, Bruce, uh, he has an excellent blog called Threat Chaos. I go to it every day. Bruce is another person that I read. Anything that he writes, I try to read. Uh, Bruce Snyder. I'm sorry, sneer, sorry. Um, yeah, but uh, so anything Bruce uh, writes, I try to read. Uh, I kind of like track him and stalk him because he, he's genius. And um, um, he's on um, this LinkedIn group called the Cyber Warfare Forum Initiative that I'm a member of. And I try to like look at stuff he's writing and stuff. But he thought, he believes, um, and he strongly believes that the cyber threat has been grossly exaggerated. So my view is that my view is that, you know, the, it's very, very, very hard to, to exaggerate cyber warfare. So, but at the same time, he has a point. So I propose this rule. I have uh, what I call the fire marshal bill test. So how did I come up with this test? Basically, I think that cyber is the new fire. So fire safety, fire awareness is so important that it's ingrained everywhere. If you look over there, there's an exit sign you know, for fire safety. If, if you were to see a, C, uh, a commercial on TV that said, you know, don't forget to change your batteries to your uh, smoke detector, you wouldn't say, hey, what the hell? You know, uh, why are they saying, t you know, why are they reminding me that? They're exaggerating the, the, the danger of fire. You would, you would think, man, I do need to change my batteries. I believe that cyber needs to become the new fire. We need to really, really be conscious of the threats of cyber and we need to become, become cyber conscious. So if someone was to come up to you and say something you wouldn't about fire, you wouldn't accuse that person of grossly exaggerating. And I don't think that you, we should accuse people of grossly exaggerating um, cyber threats. So again, I, I, I propose the, the fire marshal bill test. How do you know when someone is exaggerating uh, a cyber threat? How do you know that? Well, it takes real, real like gross exaggeration. And let me show it to you. I don't know if anybody remember Fire Marshal Bill from In Living Color. Um, Fighting broke out overnight between uh -huh. rival factions along the Israel. Honey! Honey! How's that roast coming along? It's almost ready, dear. <laughs> Gee, Dad, that sounds close. Fire Marshal Bill is the only guy that can exaggerate the fire Dad, threat. Stop right in front of the house. What's so you got to find a similar guy right, to show Let's all just the, uh, down. I'll the cyber threat this. being exaggerated. Won't you come in? Don't mind if I don't. Wow, a real fireman. That's right, Princess. Say, I sure have a beautiful family here. Why, thank you, Fire Marshal Bill. Now, how can we help you? Well, it's National Fire Safety Week. I've been going door to door looking for fire hazards. Mind if I give your place a little inspection? It's free. <laughs> Please do. Son. Does your father always smoke a pipe? Yes, sir. Pipes, cigarettes, number one cause of domestic fires. <laughs> Let me show you something. Certainly. Now, say one night you're drifting off to sleep on the couch and the pipe falls out of your hand like that. Now you start dreaming that you're having a little barbecue, you pull out a can of lighter fluid. Boom! I got fired so many times I can't even feel it anymore. The trick is not to panic. Fire is your friend. Uh -oh. Look what I found. Down at the station, we like to call this an octopus. Let me show you something. Pulleys up, 
it becomes an exposed electrical outlet. Let's just say it's after dinner, you've got a fork in your hand, somebody says, hey, I've got the leggings. Where? Where? Oh, oh, oh. Are you joking? I've been hit by lightning 19 times. That's horrible. Not really. I'm starting to enjoy it. Okay, everybody. Out to the kitchen. Okay, uh, what an idiot, right? Um, so, hold on, let me get my slide back. So I showed that example, you know, just to, just to say this. To me, it is very, very hard to exaggerate uh, the threat of cyber. It's very hard to exaggerate that. I think that uh, Bruce may have had that wrong. Again, I believe that cyber is the new fire. You know, we gotta, we gotta take it serious. So if you have, but it is a time that you need to throw the flag, right? When it is being grossly exaggerated. So when you wanna throw that flag, you know, to say someone is grossly ex exaggerating the cyber threat, think about that uh, Dundee's fire marshal bill test. If that person is not, you know, doing, you know, exaggerating stuff and being an idiot like Fire Marshal Bill, don't throw the flag, you know, cyber, cyber, uh, the cyber threat is real. So now I will get to the uh, meat and potatoes of, of my study. I'll come off my soapbox, get to the meat and, uh, meat and potatoes of it. I'll now give uh, five arguments why I believe creating a distinct body or international treaty for cyber warfare, uh, Excuse me. I'll now give five arguments why I believe we should not create a distinct body or international law or international treaty for cyber warfare. First, um, I've already shown that the current rules of war can address it. So that's reason number one. The current rules already can address the rules of cyber warfare. Uh, reason number two. Um, fields of law are seldom de demarcated by technology. I want to point to the SOMA argument. Um, that was proffered by Joseph Sommer. Basically, he argued against the creation of a distinct body of cyber law. He asserted that cyber law is not a body of law in and of itself, as technology, technologies generally do not define bodies of law. Also, he thought that it was dangerous to consider cyber law as his own body of law, and that to do so would lead to the development of bad law. Sommer um, highlighted the fact that there was never a law of the steam engine, despite its role in, uh, in technology. So, uh, so similarly, you know, I, I kind of took that Sommer argument and looked at it from a warfare standpoint and built on it. Basically, Sommer was like, you know, it was you know, if you look at old stuff that revolutionized society, like the car, you know, the steam engine, the train, it was no such thing as train law, so why should we now all of a sudden come out with cyber law? He thought that it was dangerous. Um, I think that that's very relevant to whether or not it should be an international law for cyber warfare. Now, if you look at that list right there, I have some very, very interesting treaties listed. You know, check that one out. The law of equestrian warfare, horse law. You know, at some point during warfare, it was pretty revolutionary to use horses. It was pretty revolutionary to do that. So, uh, so looking at the Soma argument, believe it or not, some of those are real and some of those are um, actually false. But before I, before I talk about which ones were false, uh, I want to point to that mask right there. It's from my favorite movie, 300. Those were uh, the immortals in one of the legendary battles in 300. If you think about it, back then, that mask was a serious technology. That, that, was, a, that was something that assisted warfare. It probably fell under the, domain, under the domain of psychological operations, but that was pretty serious. So, you know, imagine it being like the year BC or whenever uh, 300 was supposed to have taken place. And you, you show up to fight, you and, you know, Leonidas and the rest of the 300. You got to say his name like that, Leonidas. You know, imagine, you, you know, you show up and all of a sudden, you know, you see that, you know, that mask. That's very intimidating. That's a psychological effect. So, uh, so technically, they could have came out with a law that uh, basically bans the use of uh, or bans the imitation of paranormal activity. You know, that's similar to what we're trying to do now. If we come out with a law about cyber warfare, that's no different than back in the days of Leonidas. That's, that's no different from coming out with a law trying to regulate the use of masks or intimidating paranormal activity. What about when um, bows and arrows and spears and shields first started to be used? I would imagine that it was a day and time where we fought war with just fists, right? But when someone came out with the sphere or the bow or the bow and arrow, that was revolutionary. So 
you know, looking back on it, should there have been an international treaty on um, bows and arrows and shields? Now, I'll admit, you know, the first one, two, three, the first five of those, actually the first four of those are, were made up by me, just to show, drive home the point that um, just because there is a new, something new and revolutionary, we should not automatically think that we should have an international treaty. But believe it or not, the last uh, five of those were real. Um, upon the first use of aircraft in warfare, there was a treaty uh, drafted to address aerial warfare. That treaty basically was typed up, signed, never to be seen again. Also, uh, there was a use, you know, when, 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 when uh, it was some discussion about scientists wanting to, you know, modify the environment, you know, create hurricanes to support warfare. That was a real treaty, never went anywhere. That, it was also a treaty about x-rays, you know, when we started coming out with x-ray technology, they thought that that was dangerous, that was new and exciting. Came out with a treaty for that, went nowhere. Um, and last but not least, you know, the similar thing with, with banning the use of blinding lasers, you know, we came out with that. So I guess my point in showing that is we gotta, you know, we gotta remember history. Just because something is new, sexy, and exciting doesn't mean we gotta automatically think that we have to um, make a, you know, enter into an international treaty for it. So, you know, you gotta, we gotta think ahead, you know, 2,000 years from now, you know, it'll be something, a new kid on the block. And right now it's cyber. So basically we gotta recognize the power of um, the current, you know, rules of war. We gotta recognize that they, they apply um, they adequately address cyber technologies, and you know we got to go with that instead of you know having a knee-jerk reaction and coming up with an international treaty. Next, I believe that um, an unintended consequence of cyber of a cyber warfare treaty is that it may pose an undue limitation on a primarily non-lethal strategic det deterrence. Despite the many doomsday scenarios such as, nuclear, such as a nuclear power plant being hacked and causing a nuclear explosion, I believe that a cyber Katrina is unlikely. In fact, I believe that cyber warfare um, is unlikely to ever even cause the loss of human life. It could be argued that cyber warfare is a primarily non-lethal strategic d d deterrent. So, the, so my purpose in this, in this um, rule, well not rule, but this um, reason for not having an international treaty for cyber warfare is to say that maybe cyber weapons may be the greater of two evils. You know, do you want a, a missile dropping on a building, you know, possibly killing, killing thousands of people, or do you want like maybe um, an internet outage for, you know, a limited period of time? I think that cyber is a new, is, is a, uh, cyber is a, is, is a non-lethal deterrent. Because of that, um, I think that if we have an international treaty on cyber warfare, it may pose an undue limitation on what I believe is a non-lethal um, non deterrent for the most part. So I think that that's, that's very important is to recognize that cyber is non-lethal and we shouldn't put a limitation on it. So last, um, not last, but this, this one is also very important. You know, if we come out with an international treaty for cyber warfare, who will comply? You know, who's likely to comply? Right now, you know, th those people right there, you know, terrorists, extremists, those are, um, main, those are the main, main enemies. They're, they don't even abide by regular rule of law, let alone a, a rule for cyber warfare. So before we, you know, enter into an international treaty for cyber warfare, it's important to ask, you know, are our real enemies likely to comply? Probably not. Those guys don't want to hear anything about a cyber treaty or a cyber law. They don't abide by regular law. And last but not least, I believe that the rate of uh, technology will outpace the ability for an international cyber regime to produce responsive policy. Uh, while the flexibility allotted by the UN Charter is able to absorb technological advances. I say that to say this, you know, so let's say right now we set out to um, create this international treaty for cyber warfare. Six months later or a year or maybe even five years later, we come out with a treaty. By that time, technology would have revolutionized again. So each time we come out of a with a treaty, all of a sudden there's a new technology out that probably finds loopholes in that treaty. So I think with technology, we gotta stick with the current rules of war and um, abide by those because they, the current rules of war have withstand, withstood the test of time. So uh, in conclusion, you know, I believe that the laws of, cyber, of, war, of war will be tested by cyber warfare in two situations. First, prior to 
the commencements of an armed conflict and second after a conflict is ongoing. It is, it, is important, it, it is important to know that in each of these situations, the current laws of war can address the emerging issues raised by cyber warfare. Um, although several hot button issues related to cyber warfare are often discussed in few of the cyber warfare debate, I believe that they may not be issues at all. A careful analysis shows that the current UN Charter and laws of war should continue to govern cyber warfare. Um, creating an international treaty or law for cyber warfare, in my opinion, would do more, more harm than good and seriously cripple um, our country's ability to conduct war. Um, and that's all I have. <laughs>